afternoon, it's seven minutes past 12 midday. The COVID numbers on Friday were as follows. Total number of tests, 19,325. Concluded tests, 19,324. Just one person waiting a result at four o'clock on Friday. 48 people waiting for tests. Total number of active cases, one isolated individual. Looking around the world, can you imagine what everyone else uh, thinks about the Isle of Man? Well... Uh, just to run things through for you, a week today, the 21st, Alfred Cannon, MHK, the Treasury Minister, is going to be here this coming Wednesday. David Ashford, MHK, um, Health and Social Care, and Henrietta Hewitt will be along. Uh, and today, it's the uh, Home Affairs Minister, it's uh, Graham Krujean. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Um, it's... Um, uh, I mean, COVID has put strain on all our essential services. Which essential services does Home Affairs run? So uh, what comes under the department is police, uh, fire service, civil defence, prison and probation service. Um, and as part of my role as well, as also uh, chairman of the Communications Commission. How, I mean, in the middle of all COVID lockdown prison sentences, did you make sense of it at all in, in your head or was it it was a dream world for most of us? I think it was one of those things that sort of um, I just transferred into uh, Department of Home Affairs just as we got into COVID. So going into a new department and then having to deal with uh, all what was going on. The uh, whole 10 weeks, you know, it was pretty hectic all the way through, you know, for, for Council of Ministers and Tinwell going through through all the legislation. So it was a, a very busy time. And a state of emergency as well. It is. and But it was, it, I think sort of the public of the Isle of Man, what, when it was announced, you know, we, we now have a state of emergency. It was the public that took that on board. They realised how serious this situation was. And it, it, it possibly made, you know, how the police and everybody else um, behave was was because the public took it so seriously and I think that's why we're in the position we are today is because the public actually went this is serious and they took it that serious. Did the police ever experience any pushback from the public at all? I think occasionally there was a few people who they you know they didn't just go out uh, and say right you've you've breached pro uh, Covid there's a lot of uh, processes in between that and you know occasionally they would get a, a couple of people having a kickback on that but I think generally, sort of, um, from the constabulary's point of view, I, I, th I think they dealt with it well. I, I was going to ask you that. What, what, what's uh, Home Affairs relationships with the constabulary like at the moment? Uh, it's very good. You know, um, I, I have regular meetings with the uh, chief constable and there's clear separation between the department and the constabulary. The you know, chief constable uh, deals with all the operational stuff on there and we, we deliver, ask, you know, we supply him with a policy that we wish. Um because we're virtually COVID free, just one um, isolated individual and, and everyone it seems to be going rampant everywhere else. It seems to vindicate our policy of um, custodial sentences, sending people to jail. Now, you were the minister in charge of all that. How did you feel about that? Well, I, well, the, the, the courts were the ones that dealt with the sentencing. Uh, the police were dealing with the enforcement of it. Um, but talking to colleagues in the UK, you know, some of them wished that they'd done exactly the same as we did, that by putting those sentences there, it was a deterrent for mm. people. You know, and I think we had about 47 people who were sentenced to, to prison. But generally, the, you know, the public of the Isle of Man really dealt with this well. I mean, we got a bit of um, we got a bit of flack in UK papers, the Doncaster Six, the Swansea Three and people like that. And we gave people custodial sentences. So you feel it's vindicated now. We are where we are because of things like that. I think it is. You know, and, and, and people were given warnings. You know, it, it, you know for those cases that you, you spoke about, you know, when people come to the Isle of Man, you know, by coming through our borders and our borders were closed, you know, we, we are trying to protect the population of the Isle of Man. And, you know, like you said, you know, the situation that we're in now at the moment and, you know, touch wood coming into Christmas, you know, I think there's many jurisdictions out there, you know, we're an envy of them all. Um, a question in just saying, can you explain what's happening to, is it called the Emergency Services Hub? What's happening? Right. So, um, 
before I came into the department, they were looking at a uh, emergency services. Uh, so that's police, fire and ambulance all being put in one place. So it's a, a blue light hub project. Um, and I was sort of very sceptical of this big scheme because many years ago, government went and bought the Quarterbridge pub site for an expansion of the uh, fire service. And, you know, so to me, uh, a development around there for maybe the, the fire and the ambulance service seems sort of more appropriate than having this big hub. You know, um, so is the fire station going? No, no, we'll always have a fire station. <laughs> but I mean, that's that iconic site on the Peel Road. No, no, no. Well, we're looking at business cases for it. And, you know, what I've said is that I'm not convinced at the moment that it's the right thing to do is have this one big hub. Uh, and what I would, I'm asking them to do is have a look at whether we can have a fire and ambulance, possibly, say, down at the Peel Road site. Right, because the ambulance is at the back of the hospital at the moment, yes. isn't it? And, and when you look at the Peel Road site, you know, what fantastic access it has into the centre of town, to the south, you know, out to the west. You, 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 it, is, it is sort of an ideal situation. So the overall proposal would have been, if I'm right, to put ambulance, fire and police together. Yeah. In a different site. In a different site. Yes. Crikey, what would happen? What had happened to the police headquarters? Well, th this is the whole thing that we were going to be looking at. It'd be a new police headquarters, a new fire, a new ambulance. Um, and you're not convinced? No, because you know, it's, it's, it's a very expensive s scheme, as you can imagine. Um, but what we've got to look at is that the positioning of that hub, how is it going to give access to you know, the, the major conurbations around the island? Um, last week, uh, the new probation centre opened as well. How do you view the probation service? I think what we've got there is that w there's a transition uh, for people there. And you know, uh, the, the initial project, they were looking at maybe taking six people in there. They've doubled, doubled that to 12 now. And that's, that's giving support to people uh, who've been in through the system. And uh, from, from the opening there, I think it's gone really well. And obviously... Getting people, anybody who's on probation, and of course we have to put this in an island context, is that if somebody has entered the judicial process, if somebody's entered the custodial world, people will know. Yes. People will know. So it, you, you do have to turn people's lives around in the probation service. Is it on target? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? I, I think there's always more work that you can actually put into this about uh, it's, it's how you deal with rehabilitation. And that, that's a big piece of work that's um, got to be carried out. And you can, you can always try and improve on that. Uh, but I think this is a good step that we've moved forward on uh, Tremode House. And of course, you know, it, it was nice to sort of uh, have, have part of that reopened in, in memory of Bill Malarkey, you know, the previous minister. Uh, Graham Krajean, MHK, is on with us today. Uh, Russian member, 14 years now. No, Arby, Castletown and Maloo. Oh, <laughs> I'm reading another piece of paper at the moment. <laughs> 14 years. Yes, it's, it's, time flies. Do you remember when you were elected? I do. Do uh, you remember why you, you chose to become an MHK? I do. And, and part of it was that uh, it, it's quite interesting that um, you, you're always, you know, prior to that, there's, there's people who, who will complain about how things are happening, what's not happening, you know. Um, and part of that was, you know, well, somebody, you've got to do something about yeah. it. It's no use just complaining about it. And, you know, it was one of those, right, well, you know, you've got to do something about this. Do you remember the moment you suddenly decided you went from one side of the paper to the other and just thought, I'll get some nominees. I'll, I'll get people to nominate me. And I'm going to have a go. Yes, it's, <laughs> it was one of those areas that when you, when you first start thinking about standing, um, and then it's trying to get your policy together, what you really want to try and achieve. And I, I would say back in 2006, uh, when I stood, um, I never th ever thought I would be the longest serving member of the House of Keys. And, you know, because previously those people who, who'd been in for 30 years mm. and, you know, uh, I sort of topped you and Watterson by uh, about 10 minutes. It's, it's like twins. One's always been in there a bit longer. So, um, but it, it, it's it's one of those things that, to put a job description, I don't think anybody who gets into politics really realises how much of your life it actually takes over. It really does take over your life.
If you want to get in touch with Graham Kirchin, you can call 66 13 68, email studio at manxradio.com or text 166177. Uh, you are a minister. You, um, you had ministerial responsibilities before, um, education, sport and culture before home affairs, but you are a constituency MHK yes. as well. Um, how do you view things in the constituency at the moment? Well, I think um, there's, there's a lot of development going on in the constituency at the moment. So you've got the development uh, going ahead in Castletown. Uh, you've got, I think it's 300 plus houses going ahead in, in Balasala. Uh, I'm really pleased that we've made a start on Castle Russian High School. You know, that's one of the things that I'd put out there that I, I wanted to achieve was to actually get a new school because anybody who goes around that school will realise that it is really past its best before. So, you know, during my time, I was really pleased that we were able to push that forward. So the playing fields have started on that now. Um, so there's lots of stuff that's going on. There was um, the development that was supposed to be going out at Knock Russian. And it was one of the things that I'd said to the pre previous Minister for Policy and Reform when they brought forward the Castletown Housing Land Review, that it really needed to have that public inquiry you know, so that public could have their, their say. And um, the ap planning application went in and, you know, the planning appeals inspector sort of concurred that it needed a public inquiry. How can you square the, the I mean, that enormous development in Balasala um, with the situation regarding post offices at the moment? How do you, where do you stand on that? Well, I think it's quite clear where I stand on, on the post office because back in 2016, when the then board of the post office and the executive were talking about corporatization of it. And, you know, I said that it's not right to the Isle of Man. They brought a fella in, for, uh, Mr. Toimi, to, to come in and review the post office. And he was recommending corporatization. And uh, I remember this. It wasn't privatization. It was corporatization. It was corporatization. Yes. And, you know, I went and spoke to the then chief minister and expressed my concerns about it. And he he echoed my concerns and uh, it was really surprising a week later I was uh, dismissed as chairman of the post office for expressing those views that I had concerns where the post office was going and you know during my uh, Tyndall speech on it I mentioned about what had happened in Jersey you know and what they'd done in Jersey was they'd reduced the number of sub post offices they'd gone from a six day week to a five day week they'd reduced the pay of the uh, postman and look where we are today on the Isle of Man. So what will happen with the post office? Is it just a slow, long decline of, of post offices and sub-post offices? And that, that, that is the way it's looking. And, it, and you know, it, it is a concern because, you know, there's a lot of people who, who, who value that. And I understand the numbers of people going into those sub-post offices has reduced over the years. But it's a service to the community, and you can't just take that way. Not everybody is digitally enabled. Not everybody will have their own transport to get them off, and, and those are parts of the community that sort of will be missing. Uh, and also, people have got to uh, got to take their return parcels somewhere as well, and everybody's taking return parcels back uh, nowadays. And um, uh, Alaman Bank, of course, as well now, with post offices seemingly set to disappear, and two branches of the bank going as well. Set Castletown, how do you feel? I mean, crikey, what's happened there? Well, I, I think that was, a, that was a big surprise because, you know, um, over, the, over the COVID period, you know, Isle of Man Bank, th they said that was a bank that they could keep open because of, you know, the bigger banking hall. It had uh, car parking back, the rear entrance. It also had, you know, so it, it worked for them during that period. And I think it was a huge surprise to everybody that uh, they announced that they were going to close it. Uh, is it because uh, the, uh, I think the Peel and Castletown branches, they own the freehold so they can sell them, and the Port Aaron branch is leased? So presumably if that lease comes to an end, Port Aaron's going to go. Now, I didn't know that they... I thought they owned the one in Port Aaron. Um, Let's so, hope so. Um but yes, so they so they own the one in. I know they own the one in Castletown. Yeah. And you know, it's, so that it's, will be straight on the market as soon as they're gone, presumably. You, you can probably presume that that's what they're going to do is put it on the market. Um, from talking to them, they said they've already had somebody approach them for it. But I think it'll be a great loss there. Um, but you know, I have been speaking to um Lloyd's Bank, and Lloyd's are now um putting some services back in there. Uh, I know that they're in the um, commissioner's office. Um, I've spoken to Lloyd's and uh, hopefully in the new year, 
they'll be <coughs> excuse me, they'll be going to um, Morton Hall so that people can try and access some service. Yeah. It won't be cash services. It will help people sort of with their accounts and maybe sort of online services. Mm. Uh, Graham Krajim with us today. Uh, Gwen sent us a note in and just said, why have the sirens gone? Right, so one of the things that they had with the sirens was um, that, that they were getting old and the parts of them for, for replacing them and, and maintaining uh, were getting harder and harder to find. Um, we've now got a, a app called Everbridge and what you can go online, you can sign up for it and you can get phone calls, you can get texts, you can get emails and it be, can be quite specific about you know, your area. So, and you can choose how you want to receive those uh, messages. You have to sign up, don't you? For yes, yeah. yeah. And it's quite interesting, sort of. Um, so, say, say for instance, you had a situation like uh, uh, Laxey. So, so the people in Laxey, uh, they could be quite uh, area specific. Okay. So uh, the uh, the so Gwen, the sirens were old and they couldn't. Re What's happened to them, by the way? They've been taken away. Um, I, I, I think they're still on the buildings. Yes. They were fairly, like, every quarter, it was 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning, they always used to go away. So, Gwen, what you need to do is sign up for the notifications, and the various notifications, yes. aren't they? So, yes. flooding, yellow warnings, overtopping, yeah. and stuff like that. And it was quite interesting, on the, on the last day that they were supposed to sound, the one in uh, Balasala didn't go off. There we are. Um, okay, um, okay. Uh, this is for Graham Krajim. Would you... Uh, uh, concur that the Isle of Man's current drug laws are outdated and need significant changes in order to, pro to properly protect public health and society, uh, which is what the Chief Constable recently said. Did he say that? Um, I, I can't recollect those exact words, um, but um, I, I'm on a, a substance misuse um, committee and it's, it's areas that we are looking at. And so, you know, it's... I've had was it I think it's two meetings so far so we, we are working on it and you know Mr Hooper's got a motion down on uh, possibly it'll be Wednesday oh well you're home affairs minister and it's right in the middle of this where do you stand on recreational cannabis well I think what you've got to do is you've got to be real careful on this because of our, our obligations because the last thing we want is for recreational cannabis to be on the Isle of Man and then as soon as you go over into the UK, then you, you're committing an offence. And do you really want that sort of tourism like they have in, in Amsterdam? Um, I mean, is that the, is that the Home Affairs? Is that the official line? on, on, on no, the, no, no. That's no. just your view? Yes. OK. Uh, and medicinal cannabis as well? Well, I think medicinal can, cannabis, DFE, are actually working on that with health. So that's, that is getting uh, progressed. OK, all right, thanks for that. Uh, more notes in for Graham Krajean. Uh, let's see, is this true? Paul uh, sent a note in for Graham Krajean. The Quarterbridge pub was bought to be demolished for the proposed new Oval Roundabout. Um, were there plans to extend the fire station? The ambulance station was about to be moved to Peel Road from Nobles and a brand new fire station proposed between Onken and Douglas. Is that right? I'm not sure about that. Or the is one. it a Manx rumour? <laughs> It, I think uh, I, I think there's recollection that there, there was going to be. I think they called it the Disney about many years ago, and this is around about the size of a football field that was proposed with four lanes and all sorts going at uh, Quarterbridge. Oh well, everybody's um, got their own view of how to go around Quarterbridge, and not everything <laughs> always coincides. So let's just hammer this down then. The the super, if you like, the super emergency hub. So police, fire, and ambulance won't be congregating any time in the near future. No, I, I, well, the thing is, when you look at the con, when you look at the capital uh, projects for the next few years, I, I would be surprised if you had any um, big uh, blue light hub within the next sort of eight years. Uh, speed limits now. Uh, here we go. This is Kim who just said, "What about the speed limits, uh, Ballasalla, St Marks, and also the Castle Town Hump, as it were, getting rid of the rally? Where do you stand on speed limits?" Well, I think what you've, we've got to do is we've got to see what's proportionate in there because there's some areas there that, when I've spoken to the Department of Infrastructure officers there, that um, some of our speed limits are inappropriate for the areas because. If you look at some places there, single tracks, and it'll be de-restricted. Um, and I, th I think what we have to do is have a full review of, you know, what speed limits are appropriate for what areas. Um, you know, I think some of the areas that we have to address is sort of as young drivers, how do we deal with that? Because, you know, um, 
there's one thing having an R plate on your car, but it doesn't actually restrict what your car speed your car can do. I know we say that it's a 50 mile an hour on it, but maybe one of the things that we should be looking at is actually putting a restrictor on there for somebody who is on an R so that the car does not go over that sort of speed. Um, let me make a sweeping generalisation then. And you mentioned young drivers. Let me mention young male drivers and hot hatch drivers. Uh, and obviously, um, there was a big crash at the weekend. Somebody went through the, the side of a building as well. How do we, and, and the vast majority of people don't speed, but obviously we're getting stuff in St. Mark's, Balamola Strait, uh, and, and around certain uh, urban areas as well. How do you get to those people? How do you get to the people? The same, you know, it's always a minority. They're the people who litter, the people who, who on Douglas Head throw McDonald's cartons out at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You sim How do we get to those people? Uh, uh, there's a number of campaigns that I've seen out there, and some of them are, are quite harrowing, sort of, when people have lost young, young family members. And, you know, how do you continue to, to put that message across to people that, you know, Please be careful. It could be you. You're not going to be immune. I think most of us will remember sort of when we were 17 and 18, how you seem to think that you're quite invincible at that, those sort of ages. But I think what we have to do is it, it is this thing about continue to educate. And like I said, it may be a thing that we need to do is to start looking about, you know, as a, a young driver, about limiting the vehicles. Because one thing I wouldn't like to see is saying, oh, well, you can only have a vehicle with a certain engine because not all families can afford to have a vehicle mm. that a, a young person can learn to drive in. So maybe by having some sort of electronic limiting, it to having some device in there that would record you know, your speed would be helpful. OK, uh, Jan dropped us a note and just said, um, is there any update that the minister can give us on... Um uh, the um, nursing home in Balasala. I'm, I'm afraid that's that's under investigation. So there's there's nothing I can say regarding that. I'm, do, I'm sorry. Do you think that'll be opening in the future at all? Um, from what I heard, it's the doors are shut at the moment. Um, but on the investigation, I'm afraid I can't say anything on that. OK. Um, we talked about the prison sentences for COVID. Um, this is from uh, Phyllis, who just says, uh, is it true? What's the segregation for people with COVID in the prison? Are they segregated? They were, yes. Um, so so what happens if somebody goes in, there was there was 14 days. And they're all... And is there anybody? Is there any COVID in the prison at all, do we know? Or was there ever? Um, the only the only case that we had was uh, one of the ones that you previously uh, had said that somebody had gone in with it and they were segregated. All right, top past 12. Uh, loads of texts and emails in for Graham Crugin. If you want to get in touch, you can call 66 13 68. Uh, the Home Affairs Minister of Arbury Castle Town and Maloo MHK, Graham Crugin, is on with us through to one on the man in line today. <laughs>